And a great part of the, the training that we did, which is very difficult for a lot of people to understand, is an area called spring energy. Spring energy is very important because when you're dealing in a conflict or in a fight, you run into opposing energy. And what happens in opposing energy, they tend to truly come into conflict because they oppose one another, which means the bigger person will always win. Well, in my experience, that held pretty true. But Bruce Lee was the first person, and in reality, the only person I've ever known, who could say size makes no difference. People say that, but they can't back it up and support it because the big guy still wins. However, if the big guy knows what you know, yeah, he has an advantage because he has a psychological because now you're afraid, plus he can do what you do. Well, spring energy was the ingredient that allowed you to learn how to control that person's energy, to manipulate it in such a way as that his energy became yours, and if he didn't have your knowledge, you had an advantage. And again, I can demonstrate it. Spring energy is just being able to use the natural body energy in a controlled way, focused and channeled, so that it blends with yours, but only to the degree where it blends and control it, rather than to try and oppose your energy, because then we're just pushing against one another. Spring energy is like a leaf landing on the limb. It's there, but you don't really know it's there because you don't feel it, and that's the way my energy is. When, when I touch you, you'll see what I mean. It's very light. But no matter how you move, I become part of your energy because my energy is always flowing with your energy. And this is where in training, we need to first of all understand that the body needs to adapt its energy into a more soft, fluid energy. So that's why training becomes important. It isn't just suddenly you do spring energy. Then you have to marry the energy to someone else and learn what it means to become and blend with their energy. So this is why exercising and basic training, we call it uh, uh, slap sparring or uh, palm sparring, wrist palm sparring, and chi sao. This is all to give you a sensation of what spring energy is, plus teaches you how to uh, manipulate the person's energy in a controlled perimeter where the fight is taking place. Because if you're punching each other out, it's from the shoulder area down to the abdominal area up into the head. So this is where I want my energy to learn how to control and to manipulate rather than to be all over the place. Well, in order to do that, we need some sort of a exercise, especially if I'm teaching, that we can communicate. And the, the one we use is called Chi Sao. Bruce did away with Chi Sao later on in his JKD simply from my standpoint, because one, is too difficult to teach because it, it, it's, it's a little complicated the way he taught it. Uh, and also, it was sort of the secret ingredient of why Bruce was so good, why he could control you and manipulate this area. And he didn't particularly want to teach someone else to do that. He did it with us only because that was part of his early, early evolution. Well, what I did is I took Chi Sao and realized in this Western culture that people are not going to spend years like they did in Hong Kong to learn something that could be taught in a short period of time. Because Chi Sao, in reality, is only four moves. And then you take the four moves and you practice rotation. Well, my God, how long does it take to learn four moves? I can make you fairly good. And by fairly good, I mean where you feel comfortable in a weekend. A lousy weekend. I've had guy, a, a quick amusing story. I was in UK, in London, doing a seminar. And there were two kids in from Germany who were just very alive and to practice a lot of things, and they wanted to teach kids. <clears throat> and so I said, well, I'm going to teach you some chi sao. Oop, let me digress. No, this was in Germany. I was teaching these kids. So we were training in a lot of things, and, and we trained for about three or four hours in chi sao. Now, these kids had never even heard the word chi sao before. OK, boom. Two years go by. Kids are not really practicing much and practicing a bunch of stuff, but they played with Chi Sao. Now we're in the UK, and I'm doing the seminar. Well, some guy came in from Leeds or up north, and he had his little group around him. He was the cock of the walk, you know, he was a tough guy. He did Kung Fu and Wing Chun and, you know, tiddlywinks and everything else you could think of. He was a grandmaster of everything. 
nine black belts. But one thing he did was chi sao. I went, no, no kidding, I was gonna show some chi sao. And yeah, and his students were, yeah, my Sifu, blah, blah, blah. So one of the kids, who was fairly tall, uh, said, oh, we practice chi sao. And the guy says, oh yeah. He said, well, I touch hands with you. The kid hit him. And the guy went, I did it. Kid hit him again. Guy, he couldn't stop him. He said, how long have you been practicing chi sao? And he said, oh, about three hours. Now, this is not, I'm not kidding, it really happened. It's because my standpoint of learning is that everything is academic. Everything is just information. So in our culture, we don't have the time to spend years training. We got too, many, too much freedoms, too many choices. So I've structured things into their most simple format relative to academic and then application. The academic is you learn the process itself and then once you have the process, now let's train at it. Let's not train prematurely where you get confused and overwhelmed with all this information. Nah, what, let's practice the floating punch mechanics first before you try and knock the guy through the door. You know, Stances, punching, I don't care what it is. Learn the mechanics. So I'm, my specialty is mechanical teaching. I can accelerate your learning because I show you the elements that make it work and I, I, I don't make it complicated. Well, I say that, my wife says, ah, it's, everything's complicated. But I try and simplify it. So my book, I have a book called Chi Sao Made Simple. And the reason I did that is just to show you those four positions and the rotation and, and the simplicity of it. And I try and explain the elements and the details. And, and, and I actually have this uh, uh, in a teaching program uh, uh, on the internet. But it's, it's just for those who people want to be academic and, and, and learn things to, to broaden their skills or else add to their curriculum if they're an instructor. But spring energy is part of all of this. I get back to that. The spring energy is what makes trapping work. When Bruce attacked me, he just didn't touch me. He had touched me in such a ways that he absorbed my energy, redirected my energy, and then neutralized my energy, and I could do nothing about it. And again, I'll demonstrate it. It's very simple. Uh, but at the same time, you have to understand spring energy is taking your natural, alive, spontaneous energy from the body, learning how to put it into some sort of a controlled functioning structure, turn it into a technique that can be taught, communicated to the student, and then it becomes something of value. Another thing about energy and power is in, in, in martial arts, especially in karate, they hit like this. Well, I kind of envisioned 400 years ago some guy sitting around the, the, the campfire in the village hitting a, a brick accidentally and breaking it and going, wow, thinking this was a lot of power. Well, it is a lot of power. But we have a particular mechanical scientific problem here if we want to maximize the use of our body energy. You have the tricep and the bicep. The bicep is a draw, the tricep is a release. When we do something in martial arts, if we want to extend forward, our, my, our bicep relaxes. If we want to draw, the tricep relaxes, they reciprocate. If you turn your hand like this and go forward, interesting physical uh, occurrence is that the tricep and bicep both tighten up, which simply means that when I go forward, I'm starting to fight my own energy. Not only that, but I'm shortening my arm, so I have to move forward in order to actually strike effectively. Whereas if my hand is vertical, it releases and extends out much further, but it also is very fluid because the muscles are released and not tight, and the bicep and tricep reciprocate because the bicep will relax as I punch forward. So we are a vertical punching system. By that, I just simply mean that when we strike, our hand is vertical. But not only that, but we do what is called a power line. A lot of people hit, and if you examine, they have this here slight little arc in their hand where their knuckle is on the other side of their wrist. A power line is where you bring the knuckle and wrist into alignment with the forearm so that it is like a, a, a cane or a stick that's very solid. But if you put any kind of a bend in there and hit, it breaks. So when we strike, we strike as much as possible in a natural line where our whole arm lines up with our shoulder at the moment in which we strike. If you deviate from that anywhere, you lose the energy in your, usually in your elbow. 
Now, if I'm striking someone, or I'll have this case here be struck, if his elbow, his elbow is out a little bit and he pushes against me, he can feel some strength, but it tends to want to collapse. Why? Because energy is going back and he has no structural integrity because of the angle here. His elbow is out. See how my elbow is going out? That means that as I hit, energy reciprocating is going to go back. Well, it gets lost in the elbow because I don't have the power line. The same if my elbow goes in in classical Wing Chun and hit. It's not a power line. Therefore, my arm has to absorb the blow in the wrist and the elbow. Well, if a small person does it against a big person, he loses a tremendous amount of energy. So the person hitting has to stiffen up, has to do a lot of more physical uh, effort, kinetic effort, in order to make it effective. Bruce didn't like that. So, in this particular case, we understand by drills that where your elbow is very important at the moment that you strike. So, we do this very simple exercise. I will push back and he will be in a structural alignment so that he's in a natural power line we just talked about. Then he will place his elbow out just a little bit from there and I will push and he will immediately see how it changes the integrity of the structural strength of the, of the position. Now this is to motivate him to be more aware of when he's striking that he can have his arm all over the place but at the moment that he strikes he has the power alignment and he has the bridge. Very important. If he's punching and his elbow is in a little bit towards here, he can feel the same thing. It, 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 it imbalances the natural flow from the body because of the opposition. And the body is not strong enough or based where it can absorb it, so therefore it tilts over, it gives. Bruce wanted to be like a brick wall. When he fired that arm out, he did not want to lose anything back into his body. So he was very particular on how he approached striking. He not only approached striking from the standpoint of how do you hit, but what do you support the hit with? What kind of physical integrity supports and makes that punch strong so that you transfer as much with the minimum loss? All right? I'm sure I contributed something. I think the biggest thing I contributed was my intellect relative to my questions or my answers or how I enter. No one, no one knew the floating punch until in the 70s. They'd never heard of it. I was in Honolulu and Bruce Lee had finished the film with a guy named Bob Wall. He showed Bob Wall the floating punch. Now I didn't know this. I was at my club in Honolulu had the TV on, and this news thing came on, and it was Bob Wall being interviewed. And Bob said, well, I learned the floating punch. Well, that immediately caught my attention because I would not heard the word or the thought since I met Bruce. And that was, had been 10 years, over 10 years. So I went and watched it. After I called up the station and I talked to Bob, and I said, Bob, I'm Jim DeMille. I knew Bruce Lee. I did the, you know, I knew something about the floating punch. And so he came up to my club. And I said, Bob, I want you to hit me with the punch. And he did. And I went, yeah. So I hit him and really drove him back. And he said, wow, you should write a book on that. I swear to God, I wrote the book because of that. My power punch book. That was in 19, early 70s. And uh, it's, it's, it's just all from that one incident. Uh, a little problem with Bob, Bob kind of denies that I knocked him back and across the club, but I got some students who happened to have been that evening when Bob came in and was talking about it, and, and uh, that'll support it. But it was, it was just that moment in, that changed my life because it was from doing the Power Punch book that I, I advertised in Black Belt Magazine, which got exposed all around the United States and the world. People wrote me were interested in learning. I, because of that, went and did a tour across the United States. I went to Europe. All because of that one incident changed my life. Because other than that, I'd have probably just stayed in Hawaii and putzed with martial arts. But doing that book was, was very important. But at the same time, it was, it was the power punch itself was what I worked with Bruce on. So the single most important thing was the time I spent with Bruce in my apartment just down from school, uh, working on different ways of striking. 
both mechanically and with power. So, uh, and then when, once Bruce developed it, Bruce said to me, don't ever show this to anybody. And if you talk to anybody, whether it's Taki Kimura, Jesse unfortunately has passed, all these guys, Leroy Garcia, not one of them knew anything about the punch prior to me showing it and doing it. Nowhere in the martial arts world did you ever hear the word floating punch, power punch, and all that. Nowhere until after I did it, after I showed it. So that told me that it didn't exist outside of Bruce Lee's application. And I didn't care about it. I, I wasn't into fighting, so I just forgot about it. But I understood the mechanics because I was part of the process, the creative process. It wasn't that I was a creator, it's just that we're talking and hitting each other around the, the room and Bruce is knocking me over the coffee table, he busted my coffee table, as a matter of fact. Um, so I would say that was the single most, uh, if I was talking about what I contributed directly to Bruce. Other than that, I was just like the other guys, feeding back to him about different things that I did. But nothing to me that stood out relative to, to me being personally responsible for something that Bruce did other than I, I feel that our relationship in the creation of the power punch uh, uh, was definitely something that uh, I feel very good about because it was personal. Well, you know, again, Bruce spent a lot of time with a lot of us, and, and uh, very personal or in a group. Um, but the things that we would do, like in, uh, we were very much into speed and reaction speed and what is called intuitive speed. And, and I can demonstrate it to you. Uh, people wonder why I'm so fast. And I tell them, it's because you don't understand the word speed. I do. When I watch you, I don't look for your punch or your kick or what are you going to do. I look for the seed in which your body is energizing to do the technique. In other words, the body outside of a certain range has to energize to do technique because it has to move to close the gap. If I'm within reach of you, it doesn't have to do that. It just reaches out or it kicks or whatever. But if I go an inch or two past that, the body knows it cannot reach you. So in order to reach you, the body automatically and the mind work together that I have to energize to move that distance. Well, what we did in those early times is we practiced to recognize the intuitive beginning of the energy change in the body. So if I'm going to punch at you, there's a change in my body. It's an elevation of energy. It's a tightening of the shoulders. It's just something that just for a split second happens. I respond to that. I don't wait for you to kick or punch. Now, even though I'm almost 80, I can still do it to a great degree. But at the same time, it's something that you have to train to do. So what we used to do is we used to play a game. Uh, we would be near each other, but we'd be out of reach, and we would suddenly attack. And we became so extremely sensitive that you could not make any sort of an aggressive action without me responding. In other words, I'd be here, and you'd be there, and you'd do, oh boy, suddenly I would be right uh, responding. Why? Because it's something you were going to do. Jesse and I used to do this all the time. We'd be sitting across the table from one another, and we'd smack the other guy in the forehead. It was a game. And pretty soon, boom, couldn't do it. It was just that you knew. And Bruce used to do that. What he would do, and it was, he'd irritate you, because he, what he'd do is go, and he would pinch you. And it would hurt like hell. You know? But he would, instead of hitting you, he'd go, doop. Ah! It was these kind of games that were training. But it were kind of fun. Um, it would say, okay, uh, I'm going to strike at you, but I'm not going to tell you where you strike, and I want you to respond correctly. By that, I simply mean respond relative to where I'm going to strike. Well, he would say, punch at your stomach, and then he would punch at your head. You know, he would go up. You had to respond to that. Well, normally what happens is your energy goes to a point and is committed to that point and it's very difficult for you to change direction and go to another point. But that 
sort of training caused you to be spontaneous by letting your energy sort of marry their energy. By that I simply mean that if you're moving down here, but you're really going to attack high, you have to energy-wise do that yourself and change it, even though you do it fast. Well, if I'm standing in front of you and reacting to your energy rather than your technique, I will change my energy with your energy. So if you go up, then I'll be up too. Why? Because I felt your energy change. It's, it's confusing to a lot of people, but it's a kind of a game that Bruce saw as a much more finite or very unique way to tap into very sublim subliminal skills, you know, very fine technical skills, fine motor skills, but past the physical into the, it's just like, how do you talk about energy and, and touch it? You can't, it's just there. How do you train energy other than physical kinetic energy? How do you train emotional energy, intuitive energy? Well, you play games. And the games, after a while, become reality. Because it's like their subconscious is saying, oh yeah, I understand what you want to do. Let me go into my little drawer over here that specializes in that quality. Now that drawer will never open unless you do something and train in something. And then you find as you grow older that there's all kinds of interesting drawers in your subconscious that allow you to evolve to a, be better at whatever you want to do. So this is where in Bruce, training with Bruce, the games we used to play were an important part of our evolution, but they were fun games. But Bruce was, he had a humorous side. Bruce used to carry a whistle. And he would be, we would be standing in a street downtown Seattle, and he would take out the whistle and blow it. What he liked was people's reaction to the whistle. I swear he didn't do anything but blow the whistle. Or we would go to a movie. One of the guys that we had uh, worked at a place they had contacts. Now, back in the 50s, uh, uh, late 50s, early 60s, contacts were a new thing. But they had different colored contacts. So Bruce got him to get him some white and red contacts. And what he would do is he would put in the white contacts and we would go into a restaurant and he would pretend like he's blind. And he would sit there and he would talk to you in Chinese. Now, there's no way in the world we understood what he was saying. But he would talk and we go, oh yeah, he wants uh, apple pie or something, you know. Uh, but he was like, we were like his bodyguards. He liked to play this game. Um, uh, or he would pick up a menu and he would go, and, but you could see his eyes, he was blind. I mean, the eyes, he was the white, and the waitress would look at him and he would go, I'll have the, and they would say something. They go, wow, oh, like he's reading the print. The, the, he was a little kid that way. Um, we would, he would pretend like he was the ambassador's son, and we would act like bodyguards. Uh, or he, but he was a very attention-getting. He would go, we would go into, a, say, a social situation, and he would drop down, and he would do two-finger push-ups. Or he would do things and say, hold that dime out in your hand. And he would take it out of your hand before you could close your hand. All for one purpose. Bruce Lee is here. He, he needed to be the center of attention. But it was fun. To us, back in those days, it was fun. Because we're, we're, we were, uh, I don't know, to us, we weren't serious in that case. We weren't wanting to be tough or whatever. Another thing that Bruce did was um, a, a, a dear friend, Leroy Garcia, who lives still up in the Seattle area, gave Bruce a uh, small little pistol. Well, Bruce lived on the top of Ruby Chow's restaurant in a little cubby hole. I've got a picture of it. It's a little closet. And there's a little dormer window that sticks out. And the pigeons used to sit on the, on the power line. And he would shoot the pigeons. Pew, pew. And Leroy put a stop to that. He says he's going to take the gun away from him if he did it, because he said, you know, over here it's illegal to do that. You get in big trouble. So Bruce. But Leroy taught Bruce how to drive. And he had this uh, uh, old car. And Bruce would, be, Bruce, uh, Leroy's business at that job was delivering papers out in the country. I think he delivered like 600 papers, some insane amount of papers. And you would drive out these country roads stuffing newspapers in. Well, what would happen was is Leroy would stuff the newspaper in and Bruce would be 
practicing driving. And Leroy says, I can't even begin to count how many mailboxes he knocked over, how many uh, mirrors that he broke, that kind of a thing. Uh, it was just, uh, just fun sort of stuff that, as Bruce was learning things outside of martial arts. And he, he learned a lot with Bruce, with uh, Leroy, because Leroy lived out in the country. He was sort of the, the mountain man of the group. Um, uh, his wife, Sherry, loved to dance. Cute little blonde. Leroy hated to dance. Bruce loved to dance. He was cha cha champion in Hong Kong. So he used to take Sherry down to Chinatown dancing. And Sherry said one time that they were down there, a couple, uh, two or three college kids, big college kids, were making fun at him because he's Chinese and she was holy or Caucasian. And Bruce got really upset and was going to fight him. And she said it really was difficult to stop him because his honor was at stake, you know, to protect her. And she said Bruce was, was really dangerous because if he got mad, he, would, he could hurt you. And she said a number of times she had to really say, let's go, because he felt that people were being insulting to her where they were just being prejudiced. So uh, it was interesting times other than just martial arts. I mean, all these little things we used to do and fun things we used to have. We used to come out of a samurai movie, and then we would pretend like we were sent. We would walk like samurai. We'd you know, do all these kind of moves. And, and Bruce really, really got into it. He, he just loved to, to play games, fight games, and, and pretend games. And, but that was all part of the training. It was all part of the mood, the atmosphere, which made it very interesting and, and good memories from, from my side.